most notorious killers of the modern age as Peter Sutcliffe became known as the Yorkshire Ripper after a six-year killing spree in which he murdered 13 women. And now in a new documentary, Mark Williams Thomas has gained access to never-before-heard tapes in which Sutcliffe talks openly about why he committed these crimes. Wow. wow. I mean, that is shocking to hear all this sort of new information. Um, this began for you three years ago and you wouldn't have been able to make this show without the source who was behind all of this, a source that was incredibly close to him, that you sort of, in a way, had to convince to record yeah. these tapes. I mean, so many programmes have been done on the Yorkshire Ripper over the years. Uh, and when I set about looking at it, it was about what can I do now that's different yeah. and actually serves a purpose? Because what we mustn't forget is there are 13 victims of yeah. murders yeah. and their families and you know, the additional eight or at least more attempted murder victims. And so when you're doing a programme, it's about what can I do that adds value, that mm. doesn't just, just rehash all the emotions of the victims. And it was about find new evidence. Can we get from Peter Sutcliffe information that allows us to either prove other attempted murders or murders that he hasn't been convicted of, or get better understanding of him as an offender in terms of what's gone on? And we, look, we address both of those. We get two new victims in relation to attempted murders that he's never been prosecuted for, wow. that he talks in relation to, and we also pull apart his psychiatric history. This is a man who should not have been in Broadmoor. He should have been in a main prison because he wasn't schizophrenic, he was a psychopath. Well, he actually says that he was a schizophrenic, doesn't he? He said that he had a bike accident yeah. and he had a knock on the head and that's the reason why he did these murders. And he also kind of used religion yeah. in order to justify killing sex workers and mm. things like that. So. Why do you think he didn't have schizophrenia? So any offender used cognitive distortion. So that's about putting out a process in terms of, I did it for this reason. Yeah. You know, I only drive 30, 40 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour speed limit. I'm only just over the limit. So he applied exactly the same to his offending behavior. The car, the bike accident was his kind of logic in terms of trying to apply mm. why I committed those crimes. And don't forget, this is a man who over the years has been analyzed by lots of psychiatrists lots of psychologists who have pulled his life apart. And when we got Brenda to talk to him, I think this is the closest you'll get to the truth because at no stage was he aware of what we were doing. You know, we turned the tables entirely on him yeah. so that he was openly talking about what was going on in his life. And I think it's the closest you probably got to the truth of Peter Sutcliffe. And he never knew that this was happening. No, you absolutely wish, not. And the questions we put to him, I mean, it was really interesting. We, we, there was obviously real fear about broadcasting this whilst he was still alive. Yeah. We got external counsel who said, you can broadcast this whilst he's still alive. Really? And we'd love to have done that. Unfortunately, oh, unfortunately and fortunately, he died of COVID. And in fact, his last hours were really painful. And when I close the programme down, I do a very clear piece to camera, which, which sets out that this man took so many people's lives. And thankfully, at the moment and in, in the last months and years of his death, he was in real pain. Nothing to the pain that the victims have had mm, to suffer yeah. in their families. But at least there is some comfort that the man died in pain. The, um, there was... Uh... Chillingly, he admits to some of his victims being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's horrible. This is a man who says, I targeted prostitutes. That's, that's who I went for. The words in my head were telling me to go to prostitutes. Now, of course, his fifth murder, uh, when he killed Jane MacDonald, she wasn't a prostitute in any way at all. And this sets about a whole process of misogyny that existed, particularly within policing in mm -hmm. those days. And, and so some, it's, it's come up again, obviously, more recently, misogyny yeah. within the police service. But it was... This police force was primar primarily men. It was led by an individual who had a strong drinking problem, who wouldn't take any comments from other officers when they suggested, actually, look at this. Mm. And the misogyny was such that these women were not as worthy as others. Mm. So yeah. when you had the young girls being murdered who were prostitutes, when Jane McDonnell gets murdered, the whole attitude changes, not just in terms of policing, but in terms of the media, to say, this girl is now worthy, he's gone after other people. Shocking, really. You know, they were all absolutely on the same le same absolutely. level. But his justification was words in his head. That wasn't what it was. This was a man who had total control over what he was doing all the time. Mm. He'd go and kill. He'd come back home. He'd put his killing weapons in the garage, which was a knife and a hammer, and he'd go in and he'd climb in bed with Sonia. And, and they'd just carry on a normal life. This is a man who was utterly able, as psychopaths are, to live a normal life 
but compartmentalise mm. his offending behaviour. And um, yeah. he, he that the reason why he didn't admit to some of them, like in, in these tapes, he actually admits to attacking yeah. Marcella Claxton, which he never did. And you Absolutely. think that's because actually that goes against his defence yeah. of only attacking totally. sex workers. Totally, and that it's spot on. And that's why he only talked in certain ways about certain crimes. Because when he was being analysed by the psychologist and the psychiatrist, he needed to keep up this pretense. Mm. We've got an exclusive interview with Carl Sutcliffe, his brother, yeah. right at the very beginning, just after he's arrested. And Carl goes to see him with his dad. And he says to Carl, I've had to put this pretense on. You know, mm. I know that I can get out of prison eventually, but if I, if I claim to be mad in these circumstances. I mean, the other thing we get from him is he tells us for the very first time about the day that he's arrested. And it's chilling because what he tells us, and we probably work this out, but he had, we've never had it from him, is when he picks up Olivia Rivers, the prostitute that he's going to, that he gets arrested with, yeah. he literally was minutes away from killing her. Mm. And when we ask him about that, he very clearly says, why else do you think I picked her up? Oh, my, oh goodness. my God, that's horrible, So isn't it? does he show any signs of remorse in these tapes at all? He shows small signs of remorse. And the remorse, though, is, is always captured around the fact of what's the impact on him. So this is a man who doesn't believe as an offender he's as bad as some others. I, I've listened to hours and hours of, mm. of recordings from him. And he talks about other people he's in jail with as being much worse offenders than him. And that he's not that bad. Wow. He genuinely believed he was going to get out. This is a man who was so deluded that he believed at some stage he would be released back into society. He was a life lifer. He was never going to never be released. Never going anywhere. But he was deluded enough to believe that he would. There was also, throughout the documentary, you meet people that have been in contact with him that have, I mean, almost sort of idolised him yeah. in a way. Yeah. One particular guy called Daniel, who you actually speak to, and so much so that he's part of their life that his kids call him... Uncle uh, Peter. It's quite surreal. You know, I, I, I'm interviewing this guy and I haven't, haven't seen him before I go and interview him. The team had set it all up. I go and see him and there's a photograph of Peter Sutcliffe on the wall and then there's him stood by this photograph and they look so similar. And I say to him, you know, you look exactly like him. He said, well, I look like this for a long time. Like, no, you actually look... That's another documentary, actually, by the way. People but, that but is, keep in contact it, with well, Why do they like do it? Him. Why do they do it? I mean, it, it is predominantly, to be fair, it's pre predominantly women that communicate with offenders that are in jail. Um, but he's obviously... this. he become infatuated by him to a degree. And it's really difficult because these offenders are in jail for horrific crimes. Mm. And they become immortalised by some people. They become, they get put on a pedestal yeah, by yeah. some of these, these people who write to them. Why on earth? I mean, one person written to him, a, a girl from America, and wanted to marry him. Unbelievable. It, it is. I mean, as you say, it is a programme on itself it really as to is. why really these is. people end up writing. That's the next them. one. Come back and talk yeah. to us about that when you make it. However, The Ripper Speaks, uh, The Lost Tapes, Channel 5 at 10 o'clock tonight. Thank you. Thanks Thanks very you. Much.